For a thousand years, kings and queens of Europe had absolute power. But absolute power corrupts absolutely. Greed, revenge, sex, madness, witchcraft, murder. Every monarch had their royal secrets. Monarchs were not like other people. With power and wealth, absolute rulers had no limits on their self-indulgent behavior. They could realize their wildest fantasies regardless of the consequences. Tsar Peter the Great scandalized 18th century Russia with his strange obsessions, while the decadence of Henry III of France brought down his dynasty both spun into a world of the bizarre. Jousting was a popular sport in the France of the 1500s. Attended by royalty, jousting tournaments pitted muscular men, thundering horses, and clanking armor in mock battles and this dangerous sport often turned lethal. King Henry II was an active participant in these contests. But in 1559, the king was mortally injured in a jousting accident and died in agony. The royal family he left behind included a seven-year-old son who was to become Henry III. The king's death left the boy's manipulative mother, Catherine de' Medici, in control. But the tragedy was no surprise to Catherine. It had been foretold by this man, Nostradamus, Catherine's famous astrologer. He had predicted her husband's accident in bloody detail. Catherine believed in the occult and sought another prediction from the revered seer. Nostradamus provided a double-edged prophecy concerning Catherine's favorite son, Henry. Although he wasn't the next in line to the throne, Henry would rise to be king. But once king, he would bring shame to the throne of France and an end to his dynasty. Blinded by a mother's love for her favorite son, Catherine ignored the warning that the prophecy would come to pass. Catherine dominated Henry and controlled her court by resorting to witchcraft and poisoning. In an unsettled time when France was torn by bloody religious conflicts, Henry grew up shadowed by the sinister prediction and surrounded by court intrigue. Henry's older brother became King Charles IX in 1560. But the overbearing Catherine wanted Henry to have his own kingdom, so she managed to have 21-year-old Henry installed as King of Poland. Catherine was delighted, but it was a nightmare for Henry. Forced to leave an opulent Parisian life, Henry took an instant dislike to Poland. He found his subjects uncivilized, the climate unbearable, the food revolting. Henry sent homesick letters to his beloved mistress, Marie de Condé, back in Paris, using his own blood as ink. I'm dying of boredom to see you again. Nothing can console me or make me forget what I have lost in not having you here with me. But in May 1574, Catherine ordered Henry to hurry home. His brother Charles had died and the throne was his, just as Nostradamus foretold. It was rumored Catherine poisoned Charles herself to get Henry back to Paris. Henry was glad to quit his Eastern Kingdom, but he had to give his Polish nobles the slip. So he summoned them to a sumptuous banquet where he feasted them with spiced meats and vats of alcohol. When his guests fell asleep, Henry donned a disguise and ran away. The nobles woke to find their king had disappeared.
Relishing his freedom, Henry's eccentric behavior began to surface. Instead of shouldering his responsibility as King of France, Henry led his entourage to decadent Venice for an extended party. Here, Henry discovered a different world, full of colorful bazaars and exotic masked balls. Succumbing to his sensual yearnings, Henry experimented with sexual ambiguity, dressing up and exploring erotic possibilities. It led him to contract syphilis. But the party stopped when Henry ran out of money and had to return to his mother Catherine and France. When Henry returned home, he received news his longtime love, Princess Marie de Condé, had died. Deeply affected, he suffered an emotional breakdown. The King of France would never be the same again. The grieving king locked himself in a room of the Louvre Palace, refused food and drink, and allowed access only to the royal tailors. Henry raised court eyebrows when he emerged several days later sporting a black velvet suit embroidered with human skulls rather than traditional mourning clothes. If Venice brought out Henry's sensual side, Marie's death triggered a macabre twist in his character. Catherine was anxious for her son to marry and produce an heir. So the morose Henry dutifully followed his mother's wishes and married a timid and subservient woman with little social standing. To raise the king's spirits, his mother moved the court to the south of France. Ignoring his new wife, Henry remained morbid and became involved in the religious flagellants cult. Barefoot and dressed in sackcloth, the group paraded through the streets, beating themselves bloody with whips. Fascinated by the cult's piety and sensuality, Henry, wearing a necklace of skulls, forced his wife and mother to participate. Catherine tried to curb her son's excesses and encouraged him to produce an heir. But the King of France was sexually ambiguous and perhaps sterile because of his venereal disease. Henry was more interested in his bizarre pursuits than in producing an heir, and he was virtually unique among kings in not fathering a single royal bastard. Returning to Paris, the eccentric Henry's behavior took another bizarre turn. Shirking the responsibilities of a ruler, the king gathered a group of young male courtiers, contemptuously known as the Mignons, his sweeties. Nicknamed Princes of Sodom by an outraged Parisian press, the beautiful, athletic young men paraded in public, plastered in rouge and dripping with jewels. Dressed in a woman's bodice, cuddling poodles, the King of France led his sweeties through the streets of Paris. Even at manly jousting events, Henry and his friends dressed up in flamboyant, effeminate finery. Sparing no expense, the king showered his young favorites with lavish gifts, from pet monkeys to jewel-encrusted costumes. As one observer noted, One did not know whether it was a woman king or a man queen. These fine mignons, with their painted faces and long hair, are like the whores in the brothel quarter. Their frilled ruffs are over half a foot wide, and when you see a head sticking out above the pleats, you could mistake it for the head of John the Baptist on Salome's platter. The Mignons constantly fought among each other to be close to their patron, the king. Excellent swordsmen, they resolved their jealous conflicts with duels. During one sword fight, Henry's favorite mignon, the Comte de Caillou, was seriously wounded. The concerned king closed an entire street so the injured young man could recover in peace. But the man died. The devastated king insisted on honoring his friend with a state funeral and always kept a lock of the fallen favorite's hair. In the fight for power, intrigue and murder became an everyday occurrence at Henry's increasingly debauched court. To guard against plots, the king recruited 45 brutal bodyguards from among the Mignons and used them to settle old scores. 
The king heard two enemies, the Duke de Guise, charismatic leader of fanatical Catholics, and his brother, a cardinal, were plotting against him. Henry summoned ten guards, gave them daggers, and then looked on as they cut down the Catholic leader. Two days later, the cardinal was also assassinated, for which King Henry III was excommunicated and stood damned in the eyes of the church. At a time of religious strife, the king had further alienated the powerful conservative Catholics. It would come back to haunt him. By his thirties, Henry's dissolute lifestyle was taking its toll. Serious bouts of the debilitating syphilis he picked up in Venice began to prematurely age the young king. Exotic lotions could not restore his lost teeth, his missing hair, his sexual appetite. Increasingly depressed, Henry abandoned his flamboyant wardrobe for more somber clothes. Henry's physical decline coincided with political turmoil. As religious war broke out, Paris fell into the hands of the fanatical Catholics. Long at odds with the church, Henry was forced to flee his own capital. In exile from Paris, unprotected by guards, Henry was in his bedroom one night when a zealous Catholic monk broke in. Angered by the king's past decadent behavior, the monk stabbed Henry to death. Henry III's life fulfilled every aspect of the Nostradamus prophecy. His body was embalmed and sealed in a traditional lead coffin. But Catholic fanatics still controlled Paris and refused to let the king be buried at the traditional royal resting place here in the Cathedral of Saint-Denis. Henry's corpse lay forgotten in a monastery for 21 years until he was finally laid to rest in the cathedral. Bizarrely enough, the eccentric monarch lies sealed inside a marble casket on top of a strangely carved column. And all that remains is Henry's embalmed heart. Unlike Henry III's disastrous reign in 16th century France, a hundred years later, Tsar Peter the Great brought enlightened modernization to Russia. The beautiful city he built, St. Petersburg, still stands as a monument to his achievements. Towering at six foot seven inches, Peter was a driven man. Curious about everything, from surgery to shipbuilding, fireworks to freaks of nature. But Peter also had a weird dark side. Peter traveled all over Europe to slake his insatiable thirst for knowledge, but the irrepressible Tsar's drunken revelries made him a terrible house guest. During a stay in London in 1697, Peter virtually destroyed the home of writer John Evelyn. Almost 300 windows broken. Carpets and pictures ruined. Even my hedge, five whole feet in girth, it seems, did not impede the Tsar in his sport of racing our wheelbarrow. I will seek recompense for the full amount of 350 pounds and nine pence. While traveling in the Netherlands, Peter became obsessed with dentistry. The Tsar sharpened his amateur dentistry skills by practicing on unfortunate members of his court. These are teeth Peter extracted, preserved in his private collection. The molars were all healthy, but that did not deter the Tsar from indulging in his hobby. Number 10, a person who made tablecloths. Number 45, a fast walking messenger. Number 25, Madame R, the Emperor's nurse. Despite his intelligence, Peter was especially prone to bizarre behavior when he drank. The Tsar had a legendary capacity for alcohol, and it brought out his sadistic sense of humor. 
On one occasion, he drunkenly forced a respected clergyman to eat a live tortoise. When a courtier confessed to a hatred of salad, Peter force-fed the man with lettuce and vinegar until his nose poured with blood. Peter's odd behavior sometimes had lethal results. Fascinated by Western novelties, he developed a childlike love of fireworks. Fireworks at the time were huge and used military hardware like mortar shells. As with everything, Peter himself tried his hand at pyrotechnics. Unfortunately, the results matched his attempts at amateur dentistry. Several people were injured, some fatally, when pieces of shrapnel fell back to earth. Peter acquired an interest in woodwork, and while in London, he saw a wooden object that so fascinated him, he had one sent back home. It was a coffin. He introduced the innovation to Russia, where the custom had been to bury the dead in bags. He became an expert woodworker and carried the knowledge of wooden shipbuilding back to Russia, which led to the development of a great navy. During Peter's frequent absences from Russia, his palace guard conspired to revolt against him. When Peter returned home, he ordered 799 men to be tortured and executed. Their bodies were left to rot on the battlements of the Kremlin in Moscow as a lesson to others. Legend has it that each crenellation along this wall represents one of the Tsar's victims. The Tsar enjoyed seeing others suffer to keep pace with him. After one night of heavy drinking, Peter had his guests cut wood for him. Then came a breakfast of a bottle of brandy each, followed by a brisk horse ride. It was said that being Peter's friend was like walking on a volcano. The Tsar's crowning achievement was the construction of the city of St. Petersburg, which today still carries his name. And his favorite building was the Kunstkammer Museum. Wanting Russia to take an interest in medicine and natural history, especially accidents of nature, Peter ordered his subjects to send curiosities to the museum. Opened in 1714, the Kunstkammer houses one of the world's most bizarre royal collections. Closed to the general public, for the first time we offer a glimpse into the private world of Peter's obsessions. It was here Peter and his physicians convened for autopsies. The exhibits include the Tsar's personal scalpels, which he used for dissecting bodies. And Peter carved these ivory and bone models of an eyeball and an ear, a testimony to his skills as a craftsman and his fascination with anatomy. Traditionally superstitious, Russians killed accidents of nature at birth and threw them in rivers. Peter urged his subjects to preserve them in vodka and send them to the museum. The Tsar refunded their expenses and even paid for the vodka. Peter became obsessed with anatomy, dead bodies and freaks. He valued items such as these Siamese twins as prize exhibits. A giant named Bourgeois worked in the museum and when he died, he became one of the exhibits. Standing over seven feet six inches, his skeleton presides over Peter's eccentric collection. After a fire destroyed Bourgeois's skull, a new head was found to top off the skeleton. Legend has it that on certain nights, Bourgeois leaves his glass case and wanders in search of his real head. Peter established the Russian Academy of Sciences in the museum. To indulge his latest obsession of astronomy, Peter installed the great globe of Gottorp on the top floor. A forerunner of modern planetariums, the globe was a gift from a German prince. Armies of workers cut down an avenue of trees to transport the globe. The top of the building was removed to hoist the sphere into position. 
Several people could sit inside the globe as it was rotated around them. Ornate paintings of the zodiac and the heavens adorned the interior. But Peter lost interest in astronomy shortly after it was installed. From the top floor, the Tsar watched the city he founded grow. By far his most ambitious project, St. Petersburg transformed an expanse of marshland into the most beautiful city in Russia. But after an estimated 100,000 workers died from malaria during construction, St. Petersburg was known as the city built on bones. Advised by the extravagant mayor of St. Petersburg that a king should have a big house, the Tsar decided to build the Palace of Peterhof on the shores of the Baltic. Having visited the French court, he constructed what was described as the Versailles by the sea, the most northerly palace in Europe. The best European architects and engineers, with the labor of 5,000 workers, built a 22-mile-long canal and laid hundreds of miles of underground pipes for ornate fountains. But the palace had few visitors, and Peter rarely stayed there, preferring a small, modest home. Besides introducing scientific knowledge to Russia, Peter's travels also generated some strange ideas. To make Russians look more like elegant Europeans, Peter ordered all his subjects to shave. And to raise extra money for his extravagant projects, Peter introduced a beard tax and fined those who refused to shave. The Tsar first introduced his tonsorial obsession to the royal inner circle during one of his customary drinking sessions. He ordered a barber to shave the assembled guests with the same increasingly blunted razor so that men at the end of the table left the room scarred for life and covered in blood. When Peter suffered severe abdominal pains, he experimented on himself by allowing his physicians to probe and prod his bladder without benefit of anesthetic. He passed a giant kidney stone, which gained him a brief respite from the painful condition and quickly resumed a hectic schedule of inspecting factories and workshops he had established. During one of his inspection tours, Peter was caught in a storm as a boat carrying soldiers was about to be swept out to sea. The Tsar leapt into the icy waters and saved the men. But Peter's bravery proved his undoing. That night, he was gripped by chills and fevers. In the early hours of January the 28th, 1725, Peter the Great died. He was 53. Today, his death mask is on display in the Kunstkammer. Peter the Great had become an exhibit in his own museum, alongside his bizarre collection of curiosities. Peter the Great imposed his bizarre obsessions on Russia, while French King Henry III's impulsive behavior damaged France and brought down his dynasty. What might have been weird eccentricities assumed sinister implications in all-powerful monarchs when they became obsessed and consumed by the world of the bizarre.